are recording. Hey, Tom Vaughn. Hey, Billy. How's it going, man? Good. How are you? How's uh, Fayetteville these days? Well, I'm looking out the window here, so I've got the natural light in my face. Uh-huh. It's a naturally warm October day, but we're enjoying the sunshine. Hey, take it take it while you have it. I'm, I'm, I always get a little annoyed this time of year because you, you start wanting fall weather. And then, you know, especially it's pumpkin season and whatnot, and then you uh, get warm days. I'm an autumn guy, so this is when I come to life. It's, yeah. Uh, it's in the autumn. Uh-huh. I kind of go into hibernation all summer, and so now it's yeah, it's my time to slowly, uh, slowly emerge from my cocoon at this point. So one of the reasons I brought you over here um, to hang out at the whatever this is uh, – is you have studied apocalyptic writing and language for a long time, and this is it's kind of part of your wheelhouse. And going back to the last presidential cycle when it, you know, it was Clinton versus Trump, one of the things that um, I remember you talking to me about it is you were starting to take note and kind of the language that people used in politics and specific, you know, like specifically presidential elections and how they would talk like how they were talking about Clinton at that particular point. What are you seeing? What's changed in the past four years? Like what do you, or I guess not let me put it this way, more of like, what's the temperature of the world right now? Because people seem to be, have opinions all over the place. Yeah. Um, maybe to answer your question, it might be kind of interesting to just back up for a second and sort of talk through like how I approach apocalyptic rhetoric and kind of, you know, the, what, like what first like uh, got me into it was uh, when I was uh, dating my soon-to-be wife uh, in Austin, Texas, I would go down there and visit and there was this uh, pirate radio station down there that was doing a lot of uh, into the world broadcasts. Uh, you know, they were doing a lot of kind of like uh, paranoid conspiracy theory stuff, and it was kind of a lot of anti-Semitic type of rhetoric. And then they uh, they eventually got taken off the air by the FCC. So literally, like got the door kicked down mm-hmm. while they were on the air. They were talking about the brown shirts are here, they're, they're silencing us. And they went off the air for a while, and they went dead. And then this guy named Alex Jones like popped up, and this is before anybody knew who this guy was. Mm-hmm. And and so I started to kind of I realized there was something to this, that just the way he was communicating with people and the way that he was sharing these weird fantasies, this weird fantasy world that he lived in. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I was thinking, like, I wonder if people are going to gravitate towards this. Um, a few years later, I was had I was go, I was getting my hair cut, and which you notice I'm not really doing that much anymore these days. Mm-hmm. And the uh, uh, I think I just had a nuclear blast in the background. So Sorry to they, uh, the girl who cut my hair, when she found out what I studied, that I studied apocalyptic rhetoric, she um, uh, she kind of got teary-eyed, and she began to tell me about uh, her husband, who had gotten into Alex Jones, had gotten into this sort of like paranoid conspiracy stuff, and he'd become increasingly difficult to live with. Uh, he had detoured them on a, uh, a family outing on a, on a holiday vacation and took her out in the middle of the woods where he said there was this secret facility with a secret army that was going to be launched and it was going to be used to conquer and exterminate the American citizens. And there was nothing there but an old storage site. And she she asked me, you know, is there anything I could do about this? Is there anything that I could do to, uh, uh, to kind of bring him back? And I had to be the one to tell her, you can't, because... What these apocalyptic fantasies do is they actually go in and absorb the personality of the person who uh, begins to uh, uh, in, you know, interact with them. So uh, people can look at some of these people from the outside, like an Alex Jones, and say, like, well, that's just a joke. or That's so extreme. I can't believe anybody would take that seriously. Mm-hmm. The problem is, is that when somebody does take it seriously, it, it creates a situation where it, the, the, the psychotic fantasy literally absorbs who they are, and they're gone. I mean, after you live in that sort of performative world long enough, it eventually absorbs who you are, and you never really come back from it. And so what I've been seeing, like what you were talking about, is what I've been seeing is that it's becoming increasingly mainstream, mm-hmm. right? So these fantasies are actually, the fact that we now have the, the Internet, social media in particular, it's allowed these fantasies to really become 
increasingly uh, uh, increasingly uh, widespread. So it's just the internet allows one central nervous system. Uh, it's like a virus. It just jumps from one central nervous system to the next. And so what I've been watching is just something that I actually saw emerging about 10, 12 years ago. I've just, wa I've just watched it slowly just creep into the mainstream to the point uh, to where now we have um, uh, uh, we have people in the White House who actually share those fantasies uh, with their uh, with their followers, and it's uh, um, and so you know it, it's it's almost as if by having a president who sort of like buys into a lot of that, it's like he's sort of uh, dragging everybody into this 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 paranoid world which all of these people uh, inhabit, and so it's like. Uh, we're all getting a little a little taste of what it's like to be inside the mind of somebody with a certain degree of psychosis. And it's, I mean, and, and the fact of some of the places it's coming from seems to be giving it validity to people who might not normally take it seriously. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So it's a, um, uh, yeah, so when you've got things like the, uh, I guess the most recent thing is sort of the, uh, uh, you know, actually, and some of these things are old. Actually, I mean, we, we think of them like people are like like people are just now sort of learning about this whole child abuse, uh, Satan worshiping, eating babies, and that sort of thing. Right. That's old. I mean, right. that stuff is hundreds of years old. Um, these were charges that were uh, leveled against Jewish communities by uh, Christian majorities back in the medieval time. You know, they drank the blood of babies and that sort of thing. It was sort of the ultimate sort of sin to like get the communities really whipped up so that they would launch these pogroms and then go out and begin uh, exterminating people and uh, attacking uh, their their Jewish neighbors, and um, and this persisted even up into like the, the protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion, which was this uh, forged document, uh, uh, which uh, was uh, presented as a kind of Jewish conspiracy to take over the world. And, uh, hmm. And so there was a, and, and then and then we even get into like the 1970s and 80s and even the early 90s where we had, you know, the Satanist conspiracies where you had people reporting that they were being abducted by Satanist, you know, groups and uh, forced to give birth to children who would then be eaten or killed. Uh, there's very little evidence from law enforcement that anything like this ever took place, but they're just these really persistent fantasies. And if you go on, like if you go online. And, and try to look this, this stuff up, you'll find tons of books of, of what appear to be sort of personal testimonies of people talking about how uh, uh, the people have had these experiences. And, you know, and once again, you know, you would think that if you've had hundreds of babies being birthed in these kind of public environments and, and eaten or, had, or people drinking their blood, you would think at some point somebody, uh, a police officer would show up. You know what I mean? Just somebody eventually would would, would uh, start an investigation of some point. So these these fantasies are really, they're really old. It's just, wow, there's a lot of people really uh, buying into them right now. So it's uh, what, what I'm kind of, what I'm kind of, what I'm watching really, and to kind of answer your question, I'm watching to see just how healthy our, our public, uh, our, 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 our public sanity is. Like, do we have enough sort of healthy central nervous systems out there to actually um, stem the flow of these weird paranoid fantasies because they're not stopping. Uh, they're growing. They're still growing in power. So it's sort of like I'm kind of interested just to see um, uh, whether or not they will they, they can uh, absorb enough of our uh, uh, of our cultural ethos to actually um, you know take over. I mean, obviously they're, they're beginning to take over to the point of where they're, they're influencing public policy. Right. And that's yeah. an interesting world to live in. That's, I mean, and that's one of the things that I wonder about, cause right now there's a lot of people on the left, especially they're like, you know, they're, they're hoping the election goes a certain way because they, they sort of, I guess they have this belief that if, you know, Joe Biden becomes president, all this will magically go away. And I'm like, no, uh -huh. no, no, it's the undercurrent that's there is still going to be there the day after the election. And it's going to be, you know, it doesn't matter who gets elected. That's that's all the forces at play are still going to be at play. Um, yeah. it, it just may not necessarily be someone tweeting from the White House, but, you know, that, you know, Trump's still going to be tweeting no matter where he is, um, you know, so that's going to keep going. 
Um, is yeah. it something, is it politics? Is it the world that we live in right now? Or is it just strictly social media that's feeding that? Do you think, or is it, is it a cocktail of, of things going on? I think the big driver is social media. I, I think if you look at, I mean, if, if you want to take it down to like an individual level, mm -hmm. um, there are various sorts of, uh, uh, theories about, you know, you've heard about theories of neurodiversity and things like that, that people process information a little bit differently based upon, you know, how their brain works. And um, one of the things that we see that, that, that uh, a lot of uh, psychologists are beginning to recognize is a lot of people actually have a kind of delusional disorder. Now, we usually think about, oh, you're delusional and you should be in, a, mm -hmm. uh, in a, an institution or something, but in reality, there are a lot of functional people that are kind of very functional in society that actually have kind of a delusive, they live in kind of a delusive world. You know, take, for example, the person who's uh, um, uh, the, the guy, the big tech guy who was uh, spacing his name, but he was like, uh, got diagnosed with cancer. And they're like, you know, this is really treatable. We can, we've got, we've got uh, treatments that will help you with this. And he was like, no, I'm going to drink carrot juice. And, um, that's like, you know, where did, where does that, like, where does that type of mindset come from? Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people just individually there, they, they will sort of grasp on sort of myths and fantasies rather than listen to what the actual, what the actual empirical evidence. So they will defy empirical evidence um, to, um, uh, to embrace the fantasy. And uh, so, I, I mean, I, uh, Steve Jobs, I'm, I'm, I'm spacing the guy's name, but anyway, mm -hmm. He, uh, he died, you know, that he actually, like, he, he drank carrot juice until it was too late. And by the time they started giving him the actual treatment that he needed, mm -hmm. he died. And that's the, that's the, the sort of thing that you, um, uh, um, that a lot of people kind of do. And it's, it's just a, um, so, but when you have social media and you add that to the mix, what happens is you suddenly have a channel for just injecting just sort of mass paranoid fantasies out there into a community where, I don't know, 20, 30, you know, a, a substantial percentage of people are, are, um, are, are susceptible to delusional thinking. Well, and the so that's thing is, is that's the situation. I, I hear a lot of people talk, you know, they'll, they'll discount somebody who has some sort of delusional ideas and they'll, they'll say they're, un, they're not intelligent. But that's actually not necessarily true. Like I, I remember this is probably early two thousands. I was working with a, a lady. We we're doing some volunteer work, but I worked with her for like a couple of weeks, and we worked with each other all day long. Intelligent, competent human being. And then one day, she started telling me about the black helicopters that were based out of the Ozarks that would follow her. And then, like, and then she goes down this path. I probably sat there and listened to her talk about the the black helicopters that followed her and knew where she lived and everywhere she went there, they were, you know, for an afternoon. And, yeah. and then there was that. So you go from, Oh, this is a calm, rational, intelligent human being to this is an intelligent human being who has some crazy ideas. Yep. Yep. I, I know a lot of people who uh, have similar sorts of fantasies. Um, you know, people that have, you know, postgraduate degrees, doctors, you know, there are a lot of folks I know who've got, had a, a, I know for a fact are really, really smart. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's something that uh, it, it doesn't necessarily, your, your intelligence level has nothing to do with it. So what makes people more susceptible than others, you know? Well, that, that's a that's well, that's one of the big questions that a, a lot of people ask. I've been reading a, a lot of the work of folks like Julian Rain and Stephen Pinker. Mm -hmm. uh, just, that's just lately. Mm -hmm. um, they tend to focus more on kind of the biological. I'm just kind of interested in that right now, just because it's something that I haven't really had a chance to really explore in the past. Uh, what they essentially argue is that you know you just have certain sort uh, certain sorts of. Uh, um, there may be like certain types of evolutionary traits that humans have that that sort of make us a little bit more susceptible to um, uh, delusive thinking. So, if you, for example, think about you know, let's take for example, what's going to what's going to allow you to pass your genes on more successfully? A commitment to your truth or a commitment to the tribe? Mm -hmm. Like, what's going to make you more successful as a, as a human? It may be commitment to tribe. 
Um, your commitment to the truth might sound good kind of in theory, uh, but in reality, the people who were able to procreate back in the days of tribal communities uh, may have in fact been the folks who were willing to just uh, get behind whatever weird tribal idea they had and just said, you know, we're not going to worry about whether or not it's true or not. We're just going to, this is, this is what we as a community are doing and we're going to believe it because, um, and, and the, the, uh, the result of that is that ultimately that community becomes more successful. They exterminate the other tribe and they get to pass on their genes. So there's actually some evidence to, to suggest that human beings are kind of hardwired to some extent to believe them. Yeah, I was and maybe it may be actually a biological adaptation. I was reading the I'm, I'm teaching the business and professional a, chat, or a section of business and professional this semester. And so I was going over the per persuasive presentation chapter and, you know, and it, go, it gets into the age old stuff of ethos, logos and pathos. If you want to persuade someone and I was just kind of reading through that stuff and and I and I, and I had sort of the distinct thought. I was like, it, yeah, this stuff applies like this. I, I can follow this, this thinking. If you're talking about someone who's, uh, I don't want to call it an average or rational human being, whatever, like what's the legal term is like, a, you know, a nor, you know, not normal. What is that for? They always go. a basic, you know, average rational human being, these things would apply to, but it seems like when you've got somebody who's more susceptible to like an Alex Jones sort of um, personality, like they seem like they they really seem to get off on the like the uh, charismatic nature uh, of the human being and and sort of the logic part eh, that can just sort of slide off or they can just they can be a little bit more forgiving a little more forgiving with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, that's the thing that I noticed about Alex Jones is that one of the things I really loved is he did a CNN interview one time mm -hmm. and. Uh, it didn't go well. He ended up like leaning or something. I don't remember who it was what who the interviewer was, but he ended up like storming off the set. Mm -hmm. And but when he did his own, uh, he did his. He had his own uh, camera guy there, and he was acting like he was like escaping some sort of prison complex, you know, with like he and his guy. Or he was like he was like outside, and he was like, "Look, the secret police. He like there goes one right now." And some guy walks by the camera, just some guy, right? You know, and so. What I realized is he's like an actor in his own movie. Like he's just going around all the time kind of being like he's in this repressive dystopian world mm -hmm. where there are these terrible dark forces that are out to get him. And he's the noble hero of our movie who's out there like fighting against those forces. And it draws people in because it's a, you know, it's a really compelling story. You've seen that a thousand times in Hollywood movies. So, and here's this guy actually living it uh, right. for you. And so, um, yeah. So yeah, absolutely. He's really charismatic. Charisma is going he's really yeah. He's really charismatic. I mean, he gets really passionate, and, and it's one of those. I was listening to an interview with him. It was, it was an ex extended interview, probably an hour long or longer. You know, and he just completely goes off the rails. But then you realize, like, I I caught myself, like, on oh yeah, yeah, just kind of nodding. And then I was like, wait, I felt myself kind of going down that path of like, oh no, this is crazy talk. Because I think I think at that point yeah. he was talking about you know. It was aliens and, you know, how the U.S. government has, you know, a secret pact with uh, basically time jumping, universe jumping quantum aliens or some sort. And it just kept going down and down and further. Too bad they don't. <laughs> That'd be kind of cool if they did. Yeah. And it was just like, oh, OK. But it, uh, Here, well, it, here's one of the flaws in this whole theory. Like, so they have this idea. That somehow, like the, the the U.S. government is somehow this like really hyper competent or like like entity that can control weather, it can like control cancer rates, it can control all these things. Right. But um, you know, in, in reality, it's kind of like, well, if there really was this type of new world order out there that could do all these things, you know, it's not necessarily entirely a bad thing if they can control weather. We can have crowds. If we can control cancer rates, we can get rid of cancer. Um, but what we really understand is that we look at things like the war in Iraq and that sort of thing. Uh, a lot of these types of mistakes are actually just incompetence. Like it's just, it would be, it's kind of like, that's kind of the myth. It's like the myth that human beings are actually just that uh, capable. In reality, we're, we're, the, the, the government is not 
you know, it shows its incompetence over and over and over again. You know, it's composed of human beings, and human beings are imperfect and they make mistakes. So, um, like the response to COVID has not been. Um, that's kind of an example of, of, you know, it does not look orchestrated to me. It looks right. it looks fairly chaotic and and completely disorganized. So um, that you know that's kind of the the, the one of the big myths on in the. Uh, the, the world of somebody like Alex Jones, or one of the problems is that it's actually very. Uh, um, there is no central organ. If there was a central organization that was that competent and that had those, all of those abilities, mm-hmm. um, we would see evidence of it. Right now, there's not a lot of evidence that that, that that's going on. I've got a f- good friend who is he's he's high up in at least in state politics, but that gives him access to a lot of the national politics as well. And there's two things that he told me that just really sort of amazed me. Uh, one was how much theater there is in the public performance of what um, political leaders do. Um, like they may do one thing with each other behind closed doors, but then act, you know, a completely different way just to sort of appease the masses publicly. He said, but the other side was, he goes, you'd be really surprised how many people have no clue what they're doing? And he goes, you know, from the highest branches, he said, everybody's just winging it. Like they, they come in. Yeah, and they, who was the, yeah, yeah. the, the former speaker, what did he call his people? The, the, not the, the former, uh, uh, the, the guy that was there before Pelosi, but like, that like they all, they always wore the pink tie. Oh, um, like, yeah, him. I almost want to go good for it. Yep. But he called his constituents, so like, all, like the, a lot of the, he said, like, there's just an element of my constituency that are knuckle draggers. <laughs> it's just a funny way to sort of frame it, you uh-huh. know, knuckle draggers. It's just like, okay, um, you know, these, these are not, these are not sophisticated thinkers necessarily. Right. Um, so uh, that's kind of the, uh, uh, yeah. So, so a lot of times you, you, you see, um, you know, I mean, one of the, the big things about this social media and these delusive realities, I think what we're actually sort of up against here is really the next few years are going to determine whether or not we, we, we remain a democracy. Um, right. And I really am, I, I'm really not sure whether or not we can simply because if you have a, uh, if you have a system in which a critical mass of voters can actually direct you know, national policy in a direction that's uh, uniformly destructive. It eventually catches up with you economically, um, in terms of international policy. And at some point, I'm in the in the age of social media and the fact that we can now just simply just share false information so easily. Mm-hmm. I actually wonder: Can you have a democracy based upon a lack of truth? And you were like talking here about ethos, pathos, and logos. If you go back to uh, Socrates. Socrates said no. I mean, Socrates actually said, you know, democracies are destined to fail. And let's face it, they haven't really been around that long. I mean, we like, we like to say that we've been around a long time, but a couple of hundred years is nothing. Right. And so, um, you know, the, I, I, you know, I'm not saying I'm not saying that we're going to return to some sort of monarchy. I'm just saying that you know, with the rise of you know, different types of technology and maybe artificial intelligence and that type of thing, um, at some point, I, I think that I, I just I have a hard time envisioning a, a future in which uh, a democracy can survive in its current uh, uh, in its current constitution, the way that it's currently constituted. I, I, just, I have a hard a hard time seeing it survive. One of the, the things that we've, that's become what we've been used to real apparent to me is the kind of the things that we have we've the players and the technology. So, from I guess from a political standpoint, and it's I'm um, not necessarily one side or the other. Um, and algorithms and social media, they're really good at tearing down faith in institutions. And so, uh, like, you know, that was a big eye opening, uh, moment for me when I was covering the border and, you know, I'm, I'm literally there by the, you know, the, the wall, you know, telling people what I'm seeing and not, and then having people that I've known most of my life, you know, basically saying, no, no, you're lying. That's because that's, and I'm like, but you know me, why, you know, I've got, I'm not, I have no reason to, you know, distort this at all. 
and then I, it was sort of kind of a, a, a wake up call for me is like, Oh, um, this is going to be really hard to do if nobody believes what we, you know, it doesn't matter if you're telling the truth or not, if people aren't going to believe you. Right. Um, sure. Your family member did not die of COVID. They died with COVID. Right. So, you know, and, so that's the, yeah, we're, we're not even going to listen to the medical professionals during a, uh, yeah, and that's and that's the thing. It started kind of with I don't know just journalism, but then it's like okay, now science is involved in that, so you can have you know peer reviewed science, and then people are like, ah, but you know, is it really peer reviewed? Who are those peers? And it's just, it seems all they have to do is cast doubt, some sort of doubt that there's some sort of, and, and I guess that's the beauty of these kind of conspiracy theories is there's just some kind of a beauty of all you have to do is cast doubt, but you don't necessarily have to provide any evidence of a counter thing. You just have to it's like, there's something, there's just something going on behind the scenes that we're not privy to. We don't get to see, you know, the man behind the curtain who's really pulling the strings. Yeah. And especially if you can in some way convince people that you're the person manning the barricade, if you can say that those forces are trying to silence me, turn yourself into a martyr. Right. What, what political movement doesn't right. like a good martyr. Like they're, they're trying to shut me down. You don't know the battles I'm fighting, but they're trying to shut me down right and left. I mean, yeah. so what makes that so effective? Like why, why would somebody believe that? Like you've got a level of evidence, you know, you've got, look, here's, here's my reporting. Here's my cited sources. Here are all the things. This, this is the narrative. I don't have a, you know, an agenda here. And then people are just like, nope, you're part of the problem. Where does that come from? Well, uh, I think that it's a, you know, it's just when that delusion gets really entrenched, like I said, it, it eventually absorbs the personality of the, and by personality, I mean who they are. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, if you try to, uh, in, some, in some cases, if that fantasy has really taken hold, when you start challenging the basis of their worldview, mm -hmm. you're literally challenging who they are I mean, you're like it, to them. If you actually were successful in challenging the way that they saw the world, that you know, uh, immigrants are nothing but criminals, and they're pouring over the border because they want to, you know, rob the banks and rape the women, or whatever it is that they right. whatever it is they've been told. And um, to challenge that worldview, especially like worldviews based upon like race and things like that, you're literally like if you actually challenge it, it would feel to them like you were killing them. Right. Yeah. Because that's kind of what you're doing. You're destroying that part. That if your 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 personality is in part based upon your belief system, you challenge the belief system. You challenge the personality, the sense of self. When you right. challenge the sense of self, the person literally can feel like they're dying. So they will fight as if their survival is at stake at a certain point, even though uh, what they're literally fighting from is recognizing some just some element of empirical reality that that they're they're. That delusion won't let them see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, the dissonance kicks in, and I don't know. They, they, it's literally they go into sort of fight or flight mode. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So it's going to be hard to fight against. You know, I'm like I said, the jury's out. I think the next, uh, you know, the next few years are going to be really interesting to see what happens. My question, my thought is, I don't think this is something you can ever necessarily fight head on. You, you, you almost have to use the same tools that got you there to get you out of them. Like at that point, you have to change, you have to change the narrative where if somebody's going to believe that you actually try to start leading them. I don't know if that's manipulation or not. I guess it is, but you try to lead them toward a rational path, but you're doing it sort of through a, you know, path of least resistance rather than just, you know, out front. You know, verbal. Work. That's what Socrates said, and in, uh, in the Republic, that's what he said that you got to do. You know, at some point, the the people are going to believe what they're going to believe, and you got to. He said you got to. You know, don't try to tell them the truth. Just create really beautiful myths that will all get them to act in their best interest a little bit better. Create better myths than the the forces that are trying to harm them are or creating. It's going to make it better story. All right. So, how do we create a better myth in this day and age? What's what is the better myth? Um, yeah. So, I don't know. That's gonna. I, I haven't actually put my brain to that one yet, but that would be kind of an interesting question. I'm sure there are some folks on Madison Avenue. I would. That's who. That's who I would turn to first if you want to like people who will tell you, you know, spend beautiful stories about what your 
um, what you want your world to look like in some sort of ideal way, I would I would turn to the advertisers first. Well, you know, it's um, it's interesting. One of the things that I've, I've I've thought about is we can be so divided politically um, or you know culturally, so to speak, but we all like the same movies. Like we all go to see the same movies, and we all root. For, you know, we're all rooting for the same hero. But it's like we disconnect that side of the narrative, you know, because and I'm a firm believer that narratives are the way to connect with people. I don't you know, nobody really wants to be preached at. Um, but if you can create, you know, some sort of thought of, you know, this, you know, you could do this. Here's here's a good example of how life was better this way. Um, but I just feel like I don't maybe it's, it's definitely a kind of a post 9-11 thing. We've really sort of embraced sort of the warrior narrative here lately in the past dec- couple of decades. Um, you see a lot more military films, a lot more, you know, that lone survivor type of, uh, personality that gets venerated in some form or fashion. It's not so much the scholar or the, you know, the poet these days, it's, you know, the warrior. Yeah. Well, I mean, Americans have always been kind of in, in love. I mean, America is a warrior, it's a warrior society mm-hmm. and it's always kind of been in love with, uh, the brawn over the brain. I mean, the bad guy is always the brain. The good guy is always the brawn. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, but there are times when you have really hyper militaristic narratives. You know, like during the when Rambo first came out, you know, this really infantile, like you know, these these kind of you know, weird blends of, of violence and sexuality, where this oiled up, muscly guy goes out and you know, massacres a bunch of. You know, people that were being taught or some for some reason are enemies for whatever reason. Um, usually some sort of political or economic reason that we're sort of being called it. These are the people we need to be demonizing right now. And yeah, these fantasies just emerge at particular times in history. It's kind of interesting to watch them spin out and um, and to uh, and it definitely tells us something. it's a it's a good way of sort of measuring where we are as a culture at a particular moment is is uh, just how kind of infantile those narratives are. So, if you were guessing, where do you, where do you say we're going to be in the next five years, culturally speaking? Hmm. Better, worse. You know, my honest inclination right now is to five years. Wow. You know, I'm slightly hopeful, actually, which is actually saying something for me, <laughs> uh, because generally, like, I, I saw this downturn coming. Yep. Um, I knew Donald Trump was going to win the election. Yep. Like, I already knew. I knew that before he won. I saw I saw the energy building up. I wasn't surprised at all on election night. Uh, and I knew it was going to be kind of a rough ride for democracy. Now, if you're not a big fan of democracy and uh, that sort of thing, then maybe, you know, um, it's, uh, you know, you might have a different sort of view on that, but the, uh, I knew it was going to be a, I knew it was going to be a rough go. And I think that I'm seeing at least some, uh, resistance beginning to merge in some pockets where people are kind of getting a little bit kind of sick of it, I guess. I mean, it's kind of like, at what point do you get sick of, you get sick of not being able to go to the store without having to wear a mask. At what, what point do you get sick of like saying, oh, you know, I've already, I've already buried in hand. I mean, what point do you get sick of like, uh, I have a mom in the nursing home. I can't go see, right. I can't see her in person right now because I might, I might kill her. Mm-hmm. Right. So I haven't seen her in three weeks. Right. Um, and it's, uh, at what point do you get sick of that? And, um, and I do, be, I am seeing some sort of pushback against that a little bit, but uh, that hope is, it's like a 51-49 hope is what I'm saying in terms of probabilities. I think that, uh, um, you know, we'll learn a lot this election cycle and we'll certainly learn a lot in the next election cycle. And I'm just not, I'm, tr- I'm just not sure if we can dig ourselves out of it, but I do, there's my cat. I see it. I do feel a little bit more hopeful these days though, than I have in a little while, but, you know. Do you feel like the shifting shifting demographics of younger of the younger crowd is going to change a lot you know is, is some of this kind of like the you know the final throws throws of the boomer generation or is it just kind of where we are 
I, yeah, I, uh, you know, I, I like the uh, the younger generations coming through. I mean, uh, you know, uh, mm-hmm. uh, there's there's kind of a cottage industry of like making fun of them, mm-hmm. but you know, as far as I can tell, I mean, that can't possibly be any worse than than what we what we've got right now. So this, you know, I mean, they're going to inherit a total shit show. But in the uh, in the intervening moments, I really hope I. I, I wish them. I wish them luck. I'm glad they're. I'm glad they're. They're. They're, they're going to be taking over soon. And, uh, uh, and and frankly, yeah, they just can't do any worse. That, that's my. That's my opinion. So I actually, when I when I look at them, I just think to myself, like, you know, just. I mean, I'm just going to send you all the positive energy I can because y'all have got a real mess to deal with. So I'm a, I'm going to shift topics here. Um, talk a little bit about what you've been doing. Um, you sort of came out of of the shadows I don't know, a year or two ago, whenever it was, and suddenly, you know, I, I realized you've been writing um, fiction and doing so. Mm-hmm. Um, suddenly, like you had short stories getting published, and you know, but uh, you were doing like the horror genre. I, I guess is that this is that is that the right genre? I don't know. Are there subgenres in that world? Like what what exactly um, is it that you? you know, I'm kind of a hard location. Some of my, in terms of genre writing, it's uh-huh. uh, it's mainly horror, and uh, but I also have I, I'm, I'm what they would call kind of a literary hybrid, and so okay. some of my work has a kind of literary element to it. So uh, sometimes I write. It's not I don't necessarily do like the vampires and the werewolves and that sort of thing. It's it's more like a uh, um, uh, it, it's sort of like it sort of like stands both in that kind of highbrow literary thing and then in the horror genre. So it's really hard to sell, mm-hmm. and um, and I've already like found that it's kind of a uh, uh, it's it's a really kind of interesting zone to inhabit. Just to give you kind of an example, like the stuff I love to read, and mm-hmm. the stuff that I really the writers that I respect would be people like Cormac McCarthy's Blood Meridian, mm-hmm. um, Bruto Eco's Prog Cemetery, uh, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez's Hundred Years of Solitude. And if you think about those types of narratives. Um, most people would say like, oh, that's high literature, you know, Marquez, that's magical realism. Right. But if you look at it, they're really um, dark stories, right. lots of dark images and actions with uh, speculative elements in them, you know, like supernatural figures in them. Right. And uh, even somebody like for you, who's a, a journalism guy, you know, somebody uh, like Hunter Thompson, you know, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, I mean, you know, that's not direct journalistic reporting. And the whole concept there is that the guy goes to these two conventions in Las Vegas, you know, one of them, a, a prosecutor's convention for drug offenders, and they go in there on acid. Right. And that's, they have this really bad trip. I mean, it's called fear and loathing for a reason. It's one long, bad trip. Right. Las Vegas is the nightmare. So rather than inventing nightmares like uh, like werewolves and vampires, I tend to be I tend to go out and find the, the, the nightmares in the world. I, I think they're already there. It's just a matter of uh, 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 unveiling them. It's simply, it, you think it's easier for people to relate to, or to, it's actually easier to get under their skin? Because like, I, I was actually I was reading a, or I was listening to a podcast last night. It was kind of the history of werewolves and kind of where that that line of lore came from. And how it originally kind of started pretty similar to like the witchcraft and, and werewolves were, you know, these people who'd made packs with the devil and uh, as opposed to the, the versions that we have now. So, but going back to the, you know, witch trials and kind of the, the, the paranoia and the, uh, that stuff, do you think the stuff you're writing now is something that's going to, it gets into a darker place that somebody can't just discount like a vampire, like you can vampire something you see on movies, but it's not real. Yours has a little more yeah. um, reality in there. Yeah. If you want to sort of use the vampire as the idea, you know, Bram Stoker came along and he kind of like, uh, you know, his work was very derivative of Polyodori's work. It's, it's a story that Vampire right? So his more Ruth Bell was kind of the model for Count Dracula. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, that's, you know, the, the whole Dracula thing was kind of a... Uh, um, was really just sort of a, it's a story about uh, this, this Eastern European nobleman who comes and threatens the virginity of these Victorian maidens. That's really about sexual anxiety. But if you look at the vampire myth, it actually goes back to, um, there actually was an active vampire folklore in the United States, uh, in New England. 
and it was about watching your family members die of consumption. And so when one when one family member died of like tuberculosis, mm-hmm. it would spread through the family. It was a very slow type of wasting disease. And so they would at, at times go out, and this is recorded even as late as the late 1800s, and exhume the bodies of their dead family members. And uh, a doctor would open up the body. They would pull out the organs. If they found any coagulated blood on the heart, the organs would be burned. And sometimes the victim, you know, the next person who was sick, like the brother of the victim who's mm-hmm. sick, would be asked, would be required to drink, you know, this concoction of ashes and water. And that's, I mean, I mean, who needs a Victorian uh, or who needs a, a, a Eastern European count to come over and 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 bite you when you've got tuberculosis out there right. and you've got this and you've got this disease that's killing people and you don't understand why you don't even have a concept of microorganisms and so this entire folklore develops around it that's really um uh, for me it's uh you know and one of the things i actually like about hp lovecraft's story uh the shunned house is the fact that it's the only one that has a kind of accurate uh, uh vision of the american folklore behind uh the vampire and it has nothing to do with you know sexual anxiety. Although sure, you know sexual anxiety films have their place and everything. It's just not like that. Um, and so, um, but what a lot of what I kind of deal with is like the fear of death um, mm-hmm. and what, what the meaning of death. And that's kind of what the, the vampire myth is really about. It, it, it's, it's about watching the people around you die, the loved ones, the young people, and watch them one by one slowly dissipate, uh, turn pale, cough up blood. And, and die. And that was those people's reality. And these were the stories that they generated and created to try to do. So that's what I think is that, and that, you know, once again, you know, you, you, you don't really need to, uh, uh, I, I don't know, you just don't, you don't really need to, to, to invent uh, a story when you've got our reality, the reality that we live in to, to sort of draw from. And I think, I think sometimes my stories, uh, they sometimes get, uh, uh, many writers will say will say that they're somewhat a little bit challenging at times. Mm-hmm. Um, not so much because they are, uh, not so much because they're uh, they're gory or anything like that. I don't have a lot of you know. I'm, I'm not a not a, a, a real gory writer necessarily. I, I certainly don't. There are people out there that would be uh, a lot more uh, a lot more graphic in their descriptions. I actually don't spend a lot of time discussing describing violence, mm-hmm. but. What I've just been told is there is something just disturbing about the way the stories unfold, and um, and it's uh, you know not all not all editors really like it, not all readers really like it. Uh, some of them find it. Uh, 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 so I've, I've gotten you know, I've had editors react in really negative ways when I when I've sent them stories and they got kind of upset with me. And it's just the uh, um, I don't know. I started writing several years ago. Not I didn't. I didn't tell anybody I was doing it. Uh, I just sort of do, started doing it on my own, and it was for me just sort of working through like personal trauma and stuff like that. So I was just sort of like, I was unpacking some stuff, and so it was some real. You know, I was, it was some some crazy stuff was coming out. This and you know, the thing about it is, is just, you know, I'm not going to write anything that's not true, and I, you know, it's you know, I want to make sure that it rings true for me, and sometimes. The truth isn't always pretty. And so, um, you know, it doesn't mean that the story is true. It just, you know, from a standpoint of like this all really happened, but that it rings true with a certain experience or way of seeing the world. Well, and I wonder if that's what causes people to have a negative reaction is because it rings a little too true to them. And that's what I think maybe in some cases it can, you know, I mean, there are, there are a lot of editors that are, are kind enough to sort of put, you know, explain parameters to you of what they don't want to see. Mm-hmm. So let's say, for example, that, you know, they'll, they'll, for example, specify we don't want to see any animals abused in the story. We don't want stories about animal abuse. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I write a lot about the Ozarks and the Ozarks is, let's face it, it's kind of built on the abuse of animals. That's a big part of, uh, uh, of the culture up here in the hill. Mm-hmm. And um, it's just a, uh, you know, and, and certainly I think what they generally, what, what they're sort of trying to say is that nothing that glorifies that I certainly don't think my work glorifies uh, violence or anything like that. But on the other hand, it's just, it's there because it, 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 the things that are there in the world are the things that are, that, uh, um, I'm going to write about. And I'm, and, you know, and, and to me, if, if, if that seems to be something that needs to be in a story, 
I'm not going to steer away from it simply because, um, uh, uh, simply because I, if, if, it, if it needs to be there, I'm going to put it there and just sort of suffer the consequences of you know a, a reader's potential reaction. It might be negative. So, so do you think I mean, a lot of a lot of the scary stories, uh, you know, I guess going all the way back, maybe not the, the I guess, yeah, some of the grim st stories, but you know, you, you had the, the rise of like the Godzilla stories in post, you know, once the, the, the atom bomb came along. And so it was fear of radiation. And then, then I noticed, you know, the past is zombies became really popular lately, but it, it stopped being about the undead and it started being about, it was a virus taking hold. And right. that sort of faded, but I, I'm kind of wondering now in the world of COVID, if like zombies or something down the, you know, the pandemic, um, fear of pandemic is going to spawn something new. And it, well, it's fear of pandemic and society imploding around it um, seems to be the current thing, which I think might ring a little too true. Yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. I mean, but once again, these are a lot of these things are kind of like universal things. You, know, you mentioned like grim fairy tales. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, what are those things about? I mean, people think are those just invented stories or those just stories people made up and tossed out there to entertain children? You know, take for example, like the wicked stepmother, like mm -hmm. that that type of narrative. Um, there are actually this is in a, a, once again I can't remember if this is either Stephen Pinker or Julian Rain that writes about that and uh, writes about this in their work on violence. But, I mean, one of them makes the observation that children are something like a thousand times more likely to be killed by a non-biological parent than they are by a bi biological parent. Mm -hmm. And this is just a weird sort of statistic that's really difficult to explain. Now, there are some people that might hear me even say that statistic and say, I don't want to hear that. You know, don't don't right. say that type of thing. That, that, that upsets me. You're talking about children. Here. Right. But it's like, but it's but if that's the way it is, you know, and you go back to like the evil stepmother, it's like. Maybe those fairy tales are like tell it. Maybe it's an instructional kit. It's like, hey kids, when mom dies in childbirth and dad remarries, guess what? You better watch out. You know, especially back in like the medieval period and that sort of thing. You can kind of imagine things getting kind of rough for uh, rough for the offspring at that point. So what the, what I think that the fairy tales are is they're kind of like containers of trauma, just like shared past cultural trauma, and they. Um, and so, like with Godzilla, you know, when, when Godzilla first came out of the ocean in the 1940s, you know, that first black and white one, mm -hmm. um, it's not some cute monster movie. It's not some cute little thing. And Godzilla's not a good guy. Right. Um, one of the things that's very striking about that movie is the fact it's one of the only ones where you actually see hospitals. So mm -hmm. Godzilla's gone through. And then we're, you know, where are you going to be after Godzilla? You're not going to be standing on top of a volcano or your helicopter going like, woohoo, or something like that. Right. You're going to be in the hospital with radiation burns. Right. So you see all the patients lined up with radiation burns and children dying. It's weird, you know. And of course, eventually they had to sanitize it and make it a little bit more um, something that would be easier to market to a sensitive audience. Mm -hmm. But that first Godzilla movie was, you're absolutely right. That was that was just a little PTSD from two atomic bombs. Yeah. So what do you think is going to come out of now? Do you have any idea? Are you going to be the king of that new genre? Oh no 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 no! Dys I, I don't. I don't know about the of, uh, yeah, I don't. I don't know about the. Uh, uh, you know, I'm just doing my thing. I'm not trying to to catch any type of popular wave. Or anything. Mm -hmm. I think that it's. Uh, you know, I, I think that in some ways uh, th there are some folks that you know disease pandemic books are always coming out. They have been for right. for years. The, the folks who I know who had them that came out right during when, when COVID hit, it was kind of like, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Because on the one hand, are people going to be more interested in the virus or are they going to be more like, I'm sick of it. <laughs> I'm right. in this. I don't want to read about it. So um, my guess is, you know, actually you might see some stuff that's more escapist. Uh, that, that might, that's entirely possible. You might see something that's completely, uh, um, uh, I could see, I could easily see it like going from, uh, less dystopian types of, of discourse into something uh, more archetypal or something, you know, frankly, more, you know, maybe more science fiction or something. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, it, it's an interesting time to see. And, and you can think about the other anxieties that the COVID might, for example, bring out. I mean, it could be something like isolation. Mm -hmm. It could be something like, 
provide a uh, lack of community, could be a fragmented community, um, maybe even, you know, also, you know, just the fact that people are now losing family members. You know, I, I, I look at like, you know, who knows, like the folks who, who lived through this thing in New York, you know, when it first hit and it was just like killing, it was just, it was killing thousands of people a day. Right. And imagine the neighborhoods that just got decimated by that. Um, I don't, you know, and, and there's a writer up there somewhere in one of those apartments and, and one of those enclaves in New York. And God only knows what they're going to what they're going to come up with out of this, all this, this mess. I mean, yes, yeah, it's going to be interesting. Though. Something out of their own trauma is going to come out of it. Um, I would imagine. Now, um, the isolation's a real thing. Like I'm out here at the cabin, and and like, legitimately. This conversation will probably be the biggest, longest conversation I have with anyone all week. Like, and this is kind of one of the reasons I started doing, you know, this thing is like, I know some interesting people out in the world that, and actually, this is sort of the one shot I've got where they're, um, I can sit down and talk to them. You know, uh, I guess the thing, the technology suddenly got better real fast on that you can do things like this, or at least more available. And, so, but the isolation's real. Like I've, I've had days where I realized I probably haven't said 10 words because I'm just by myself out here and I'm just kind of, and so you, you live in those, that bubble of your own head for a while. It's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I, I find it interesting. I, I find it kind of an interesting exercise to do. So it's, uh, um, yeah, I, I find I'm processing information differently as a result of occasionally going days without, uh, you know, obviously, I, I have my, my wife here in the house with me, but, um, you know, on, on, during periods of time when she's working a lot, like she works mm-hmm. a lot, uh, on, you know, I, can, I can go for long periods where I'm just, yeah, but I'm a Buddhist, so I meditate. You know, I'm just like, okay, I'm just, I pretend I'm in retreat. And I just like, uh, I just go into, uh, I just go into meditation mode. It's a... Uh... I've definitely become more aware of some of the things that bug me. I think they like the noise, the level of noise went down in a lot of ways. And so it allowed me to focus. That's one of the reasons I got rid of my social media now, um, stuff on my phone. Like I was like, I am tired of this. It was like, I'm, this is, this is officially a, a negative influence on my life. And so, yeah. and I, and so I started looking for ways to, in that respect, kind of uh, systematically inconvenience myself more. Um, like, like if I want to check my Facebook, I have to physically go to the computer and sit down and log on and check it now or have a conversation with somebody. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I, mark, I mark the number. I think that's a great idea. I mark the number of times I do it. Like I have like a, um, like something like Facebook, I can only check once a day. Mm-hmm. So it's just like, okay, I'm only, you know, you can, you can look at it once and then you got to walk away from it because like, if I look at it at like eight o'clock at night and I'm going to be going to bed at like 10 30 or 11, yeah, it'll ramp me up. So you know, if I see, I'll just see one thing, and I'll be like, eh, and then like some some thought will spiral, and then it's just like, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna take this time for me and just sort of sit down and uh, indulge in some more wholesome, transparent type of thought. I'm gonna I'm gonna I, I need to occasionally withdraw from that delusional realm in order to uh, well and uh, maintain my. Own. I tried to just go like first. I just tried to put limits on it. Like I left the apps on. You could, you know, you can put the reminders and like, okay, if you spent X number of time on this app, it'll tell you it'll it'll shut it off. But you know, it always gives you the option just to, you know, ignore it so you could keep going. And then and so I started becoming conscious of like how quickly in the day I hit my limit, and then that became problematic because I realized okay, I'm just and you just see the screen time and, and, and I just didn't want it. And I didn't want to be that way anymore. And it was, I could feel it just sort of dragging my soul down. Um, let me actually, and I, we got off topic. Uh, one of the, I wanted to ask you, you have a book coming out soon, right? It's not out yet. It's coming out soon. What is it? When's it? It's on pre-order. Right now. It's on pre-order. Okay. What's the name of the book? And give me a, uh, just tell me about it. Uh, well, it was. It's been picked up by the uh, the folks at Bad Dream Entertainment, okay. uh, which is an independent press, and the name of it's called the Ethereal Transit Society. Okay, and it's about a, and it's about an apocalyptic cult out in California, uh, a UFO cult, and they have committed mass suicide with the exception of three members. Three members were left behind for very each for various reasons. We're not at the 
the uh, the cult's compound at the time that the uh, the other members departed, mm -hmm. and so each of them are, have been shattered in various ways by this loss. I mean, they're they're wrapped by guilt and anger uh, and regret and all these things, and so they're all kind of they've all dispersed in uh, California. Of course, you, know, you become if you're a, a left behind of one of these cults, you oftentimes become very infamous. You become a target for law enforcement. So they haven't had really great lives. And then suddenly, the leader of the cult, this charismatic leader named Quint, uh, who was the, uh, the, 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 the force that really drove the, their community, uh, he begins sick, they begin to sense his presence. Now, Quint was one of the ones who also committed mass suicide. But while the rest of the members got buried in a mass grave out in California, Quint had had made arrangements to have his body transmitted back to where he was from, which was the Ozark Mountains in Madison County, Arkansas. And so what you have in the story is he begins signing out, sending out the signal called the transit frequency. And the transit frequency is kind of like this meditation signal that they would all tune in on during their meditation sections, their sessions. Mm -hmm. And then it turns out that they are, they begin to hear it again. And they're like, oh, my God, he's sending out that frequency again, but he's dead. Mm -hmm. And so the story begins with these three former UFO cult members um, going to Madison County, Arkansas, back in the hills to try to find the place where their former uh, charismatic leader was buried. And all the shenanigans that so, come along with that. Is it modern day? Uh, well, the... the uh, uh, the, the way that the, the, the editor described it on the book jacket is that sometimes apocalyptic cults get it right. <laughs> and so um, the, uh, it, the, the, the entire narrative takes place over less than 24 hours. So it's almost real time. So if you read it, you're almost reading it in real time. Okay. And um, uh, I think that one of the reviewers on Goodreads said something like, uh, he packs a lot into, you know, it's not a real long book, it's actually a, a, a novella. And he said he packs a lot in there. So it's a, uh, a lot of things happen in that 24 hours um, uh, to, uh, to these individuals. You can, you can imagine how they would be received in a place like, like Madison County. Mm -hmm. um, they go there and they actually find that a lot of people in the community are suffering from this kind of mass psychosis. And so... Um, that's because the transit frequency is vibrating really strong in this community, and it's causing all of these um, disruptions in various sorts of wildlife and people. Like they're they're becoming increasingly anxious and paranoid mm -hmm. uh, because they don't know what it is that's agitating them. And so they're entering into this community, which at this point is 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 really struggling, trying to figure out what's going on. And um, and then, yeah, from there, they, they have to, uh, to figure out a way to, to navigate this, are you uh, this terrain. Are you sure you don't know something about our modern life that you're not telling me right now? Well, because it feels like that, that's a little that's that's hitting the nail on the head pretty solid. Yeah, it's it's well, like I said, I don't write anything that isn't true. Right. Yeah. If it doesn't ring true with a certain type of experience or worldview. It's, uh, it, I, I don't, I don't want to write it. So, um, so I'm trying to like describe it without like, uh, uh giving the actual plot. Right. Yeah. I don't, yeah. But it's a, uh, um, uh, let's just say that, um, that there are adult themes, there is violence, there is, um, but the people and the, the people who are members of this cult, one of the things that uh, some of the reviewers have been kind enough to, to uh, say about it is that they find it very authentic. Mm -hmm. Because bear in mind, I've been studying cults mm -hmm. for a long time, and so I, it, I'm not. I, I really try very hard not to present some sort of cartoon version of what a cult is. Right. Um, these are actual people. Charismatic leaders don't just come in and like take over and like you know just pour information in people's brains. Right. There's a kind of energetic exchange between the members of the cult and the and the leader. Sometimes the leader has to become what the people in the cult want that leader to be. It's really strange to sometimes watch these dynamics unfold. And so each of these people had a very complicated rape relationship with them. Um, uh, the three remaining mem members, their cult names, every, you, get a, you get a different name when you enter this cult. Their cult names were Om, Astra, and Z. And each of them had sort of a unique relationship with Quint. Each of them were kind of like working through uh, 
some of those uh, uh, some of those issues, and they have like issues with each other. They they don't have a very fluid relationship with each mm-hmm. other. But like one of the things that's kind of interesting is that when they begin to readapt to and begin to readopt their cult personalities, you know, they've been kind of out of the cult for a year and away from each other. Once they sort of move back into that sphere with each other, their interactions become easier, and they begin to sort of uh, uh, they begin to uh, uh, function better as a as a team. So. Um, which isn't really happening for them, of course. So, but what it, what it's t- it's told from a first person narrative point of view. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've tried to create, you know, an, a fairly authentic voice uh, for the the person who is is actually telling the story. Uh, the uh, uh, who's uh, uh, who's one of the, one of the one of the the, the left behind cult members, and uh, he, he's a survivor of a self inflicted gunshot wound, and so. I, I try as, as best I can to try to um, present them. And you know, one of the things that I actually tried to do in my class when I taught apocalyptic rhetoric is that it was really easy for students to kind of step back and go like, well, that's just crazy. That's mm-hmm. crazy. Why would anybody think that or believe that? Why would somebody think a flying saucer is going to come and pick them up? Right. It's like, well, have you ever thought about some of the things you believe? You know, have you ever thought about the fact that, you know, you, you know, you've got talking snakes and you've got, you know, uh, you know, a, a blood drinking God who comes and drinks his, the blood of his son. And then, um, you know, and somehow that, that equates to some form of salvation. And it's, it's kind of like, you know, I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying like, it sounds kind of strange. If right. you were to, you were to like, explain that story to somebody who'd never heard it before, it would sound a little bit unusual. And so um, it's just because you grew up with it and all the people around you reinforce it, that it seems like it's, it, it's, it's, it's normal. So what I really tried to do is try to uh, present a lot of these cults for what they were, which were oftentimes groups of people who were seekers, mm-hmm. and they uh, they would go out and they would find a set of ideas or a community uh, with which they could um, they could uh, with which in which they felt more at home, and they uh, uh, and some and sometimes they had very destructive consequences. There's no doubt about that. Um, but to simply you know dismiss them as crazy or something like that is well, that was is, the, is really kind of missing the point. That was the Jim Jones thing. I mean, the whole Jonestown. I mean, he started out as this you know a progressive preacher, and he had a huge into social justice stuff, and the and the the political parties loved him, and uh, he had a huge following. Yeah. And then, yeah. and then, and then, and I remember watching the, it was the Jonestown documentary, but it, something you said reminded me of him, um, is that he would be, and he would tell people he would be whatever person, one of his followers needed him to be. Like, if you need yeah. me to be, in, That's what Manson said too. yeah, he's like, if you need me to be your daddy, I'll be your daddy. If you need me to be, basically, if you need me to be your lover, I'll be your lover, whatever it is you need out. And then that progressed. If you need me to be God, then I will be God. And, yeah. and, and then yeah, I'm sure that they're, they're, I'm sure that, yeah, the Jonestown was most certainly a, a kind of a, a synergy between the group and, and, and their leader, uh, and Jones. Um, mm-hmm. and he was a, uh, um, yeah, and and he was, you know, he he obviously once he sort of went down that road of the kind of paranoid delusions and everything, um, he just kind of pulled them down into that whirlpool. But uh, yeah, watching that particular community evolve over time is is a a really fascinating. And actually, the, the, if it's the documentary I'm thinking of, which you had seen. Um, that sound that you get where they commit mass suicide and they don't have a video, but they have the audio mm-hmm. of the people screaming. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, it, um, you, you people talk about like drinking the Kool-Aid, like it's some kind of a joke. I don't actually make that joke anymore because after I actually listen to the audio of mothers feeding poison the to their first. children and, and just the, the cries of warning. I mean, it's just, it's like people mourn. They're watching their loved ones die one at a time. Yeah, and it's just this constant wail. Um, uh, if there's a hell, it, it may very well sound like that. Yeah. So, um, okay. <laughs> so it's a it's a with these, but yeah. So when you when you look at these uh, the, these communities, um, actually the one that I kind of deal with in the, the ethereal transit society, they're more like some of the UFO cults out in California. 
which were not, uh, they weren't based on sexual predation. I mean, like Charles Manson, the first thing he would do when a new girl came to the ranch is he would kind of, you know, have sex with them, you know, and oftentimes in a very sort of uh, um, uh, aggressive type of way, right? It, it was all about, use, he, he would, or, or he would tell them to go have sex with some guy that he just met, you know, some guy that he wanted a favor from. Right. So this is, some of some of these groups are not actually, the one I'm writing about is not really about sexual domination and submission. Um, uh, and some of them, in fact, were, uh, you know, like Heaven's Gate, for example. Yeah, I was just about the uh, Heaven's Gate group. I was asked. Yeah, I mean, they were actually trying to get out of their bodies. They were trying to get away from their sexual desire, trying to get away from all of that. So uh, this group is a little bit uh, more similar to something like that, where you have a they're they're trying to sort of rise above the human condition. Um, and Quint, their former leader, is not the he was not really the sort that was uh, uh, into uh, sadism or, or trying to uh, uh, victimize people. So when's the book come out? Uh, it's going to be, it's on pre-order right now on mm -hmm. Amazon and, uh, it will be coming out in early December. I think or December 7th will be the, the publication date. But if you want to go look at it on Amazon, uh, it's called the Ethereal Transit Society and it is, uh, um, I don't think it's real expensive. I think it's like five or six bucks or something like that. And, um, you can either order, pre-order, pre-order a, uh, a uh, an ebook version or a, uh, a hard copy. So I've actually got. Let me see if I can find a. I don't have the. I don't have the the proof yet. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I can look up the. Uh, you know, actually, publishing a book has. A, I've learned a lot that my the editor I'm working with over at Bad Dream Entertainment is really teaching me a lot about just the publication process that I've mm -hmm. learned about. So, you know, even just things like, uh, uh, just things like, you know, doing the, you know, getting the cover done and getting that sent off to the, the printers and everything. It's, it's, uh, um, it's all like, I think it's just, uh, I'm, I'm learning so much and see, it's actually, that's $5, $5 for the Kindle version, uh, twelve ninety nine for paperback. And, Here's kind of what the, the cover looks like. I don't know, that's going to be backwards, nope. isn't it? Nope, I can. Yeah, it's it's fine. It's right. Can read it? Yep, I can. It's read got it. like a. It's got the transit light up there. That's those are supposed to be the Ozark Mountains there. Gotcha. Okay. So, but uh, uh, but yeah, I'm learning a lot about the the process of getting books out to reviewers, and there are some reviews of it now on Goodreads, and they're honest reviews. You can tell because they're not all five. You know, if you see a book and they're all fine, you've got to be like, okay, I'm not really sure if this is actually. Mm -hmm. They're probably not real. So the the reviews are, I think, are pretty honest, and the, the folks are, um, uh, they like some things. Some folks, you know, frankly, I think my, my theory of reviews is that um, it's sometimes good to have a couple of really bad ones, you know, where people read the book and they're like, I hated this. I can't, it, it upset me. You know, kind of like, usually that's what I look for. If I... If I see like movie reviews or book reviews and they're all really positive, I'm like, well, this is just getting boring. Um, I feel that if I way. see one and at least a couple of like people getting upset about it, I'm kind of like, oh, okay, this is a. I, I feel the same they, way about student they evaluations. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I found the instructor offensive, and you know, yeah, then it's a, uh, it's like then doing you're doing your job, doing 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 what I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Tom. We've we've gone over an hour. I've, I I mean, I've got I've got nothing left. Oh, uh, I do have one other thing because I'm going to be doing a reading of one of your short stories um, mm -hmm. for this part. Anything you want to say about that before uh, I do it, so people tease it a little bit before I read it? Yeah, you know, the story I sent over is called "Deleted Scenes," mm -hmm. and uh, uh, it's it's kind of it's about a washed up uh, uh, actor from the exploitation era of cinema. Especially from those uh, those Italian jungle movies that came out in the 1970s. I don't know. You might have a, a, a younger listenership, uh, but just to give you a little background, those, those particular movies were considered like the worst of the worst in terms of exploitation cinema, uh, just because they were so. Uh, the 70s was a time when when horror movies took a really, really, really dark turn, mm -hmm. um, and 
and the the jungle holocaust films were kind of uh, definitely uh, uh, among the worst offenders when it came to uh, just assaulting the audience with as many uh, upsetting images as they possibly could. So this story is about a uh, one of an actor from one of those movies being invited to a, um, a convention where they're going to be viewing one of those films and, and talking about it and interviewing them on stage. And it, it ends up taking a kind of unexpected turn for it. So it's all about the fan convention experience for a for somebody in that line of work. All right. Hey, do you have a website that people can right. do your track you down? Are you? Uh, I, I, I'm guessing you're not a big social media guy, but uh, you do have a website, don't you? Yeah, yeah. I've, uh, I do do Facebook. I'm, I need. I know. I'm, I probably need to ask you about this because you're like the guy that's really good at like reaching out to people. In these formats. So I'm thinking about maybe starting an Instagram or something. I really don't think I've got. I don't think I'm really. I don't think I can really launch a. Are they, Tech talk. I don't really think I, I, I may not have the uh, the right type of sensibility for being able to do that. But um, but in terms of a website, you can go to brokentransmitter.com. And sure. There's a little bit there, that that shows you about what I think about my writing right there. Brokentransmitter.com. It's like I'm a broken transmitter. So, uh, but here's the thing. I think sometimes broken, like you know how. Guys you know, like William S. Burrow. It's like like Hunter Thompson. Mm -hmm. What makes Hunter Thompson interesting? He's broken. He's kind of <laughs> he's kind of a broken person, you know. It's it's his it's his brokenness that makes him kind of interesting. So, yeah. um, so that that's why I uh, I chose that. Uh, what, so I chose that, that. I like it. Whatever they call it. I like it. Yeah, your URL or whatever it is. All right, Doctor Vaughn. It's been in, it's been enjoyable. All right, really. I, mi I miss our conversation. Awesome, man. Thanks for doing this. Oh no problem. Like I yeah. seriously miss our conversations when you can just kind of wander around and just sort of pop into somebody's office and talk and you're yeah. those guys right, are in your office and just say a bunch of disturbing non sequitur things uh, yeah and then just walk kind of yeah and then you just walk away and then yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just interfered with your life a little bit there. It's okay. I don't. I don't. I didn't mind. It just. It, it added a nice little um, interesting piece of punctuation to my day. So, all right. Well, you have a wonderful day, and uh, say hi to the cat, and you uh, know, hopefully, uh, we'll do this again soon. Awesome. Good luck in the cabin. All right, man. Thanks. So long. All right. Take care.